comments below. Uh, but if you've got Q&A, if you've got questions you'd like me to answer, nutritionally related questions, we're going to take those. Um, some of these are EMF related, and I'll do my best to get these answered, realizing that I'm more of a nutritional expert and not an EMF expert. Um, and I'd encourage anyone watching this q and if you're not already uh, if you're not already signed up for the EMF Summit, um, where there are a number of different expert scientists that are being interviewed on their um, knowledge base of the harmful effects of EMF and other radio frequency radiation, um, you're going to want to check that summit out because you're going to get a lot of answers um, from that event. And we'll put a link to register below this video as well so that you can go get a deeper dive on that information. So first question coming in from Stacy: I have an infrared sauna and have measured the EMFs, which are higher than what they say. They are as low EMF sauna. They are a low EMF sauna, but when I put the tester a few inches away, it drops significantly. Is it still detrimental to be using this? So part, partly is, is what's, the, what's, the, um, what's the output? So if it's high when you're sitting in it and you're right in it, you know, if you're EMF sensitive, I would say be careful, be cautious. If you're not really EMF sensitive and you're using the sauna periodically, look, we are all exposed to EMF every day. I don't, I, I didn't have Nick on as a guest to scare anyone away from being exposed to any form of EMF, but many of you are sensitive. Many of you are struggling tremendously in your health. And, um, and so this is just another avenue for you to look at and, you know, take action accordingly to protect yourself. So I, I would argue that if you get in your sauna and it makes you feel dizzy or lightheaded, gives you, uh, you know, nefarious types of symptoms, you know, beyond the sweating, then you might want to reconsider using it if it's emitting a high level of EMF. Um, you might also reach out to the company and ask them why, uh, why your readings are higher than what they're advertising. But that's, that's where I would start. Uh, Lynn's asking about slippery elm, whether or not it's high oxalate. There's not been enough research on slippery elm that I have seen Lynn uh, being high or low oxalate. Um, so if you were using slippery elm as like a supplemental product, I would also argue that most of the time it comes in 500 milligram capsule. So the, even if it had higher oxalate, if you're using one or two capsules a day to coat your gut, you're not getting mega exposure to high oxalate from those small dose capsule sizes. As far as a probiotic that helps digest oxalate or break down oxalate, um, our ultrabiotic defense does. Any, any um, lactobacillus species can help degrade oxalate. There's another type of, of bacteria called oxalobacter, but there, at, to date, there are no commercially available ways to take oxalobacter in a supplement. So lactobacillus is going to be one of your best bets. I like this. Ken says, feedback. The intracellular test is amazing. Immediate positive results. I know what to take for optimum cell health. Thank you. You're welcome, Ken. I'm glad you're finding value out of the testing services and feeling better as a result. Um, how much histocyst should you take to support yourself during uh, allergy season? The dose, you know, if you're taking it aggressively anywhere from uh, two to eight capsules per day. That's, a, again, on the higher end, that's really aggressive. But um, if, that if you have an aggressive allergy season, two capsules every three to four hours while you're awake is the recommended dose for those of you really struggling. When will ultra nutrients be back in stock? Um, we're expecting them, I think, in about six weeks. Um, don't hold me to that exact time framing because you know, right now we're waiting on what, what the reason why we, why we're held up is quality control. We take quality control extremely serious. And so when we see an ingredients coming in to our facility that is contaminated or contains something that it's not supposed to contain, we kick it back. And because of that, it sometimes takes us a little bit longer to manufacture because we won't compromise on our ingredients. So please be patient with us. We'll, we'll have it back soon. Or garbanzo flour and cassava flour gluten-free, assuming no cross-contamination. Yes, they are both gluten-free. 
Can a cavity that has gone into the dentin heal on its own if I change my diet and get vitamins and don't use fluoride? It's hard to say for sure, Laura. Um, one, I'm not a dentist, so it'd be better to ask a dentist, that a biological dentist specifically, that question. Um, but but two, I've seen cavities heal, but whether or not they were, were penetrating through the dentin or not, um, um, can't can't really comment one way or the other on that. Can my phone being in my pant pockets all day long lead to leg cancer? There are some studies showing that high uh, exposure to the radiation in the phone can increase the risk for the development of certain types of cancers. Um, I certainly wouldn't carry your cell phone in your pocket if it's not um, if it's not wrapped in either some type of EMF blocking material. Uh, or if it's not an airplane mode. Um, a lot of you, your cell phones are like an extension of your body, uh, and it shouldn't be. You should, you know, you should definitely consider, I actually have a special case around my cell phone that blocks any kind of radiation uh, for that very reason, but I never carry my cell phone in my pocket, and I never carry my cell phone, like, on my body. I, I, um, I usually either have it in a, in a case or a bag, uh, I'll hold it in my hand, oh, you know, but I won't, I won't put it in my pocket for any depth or length of time. Uh, let's see here. I've been taking sea kelp to get my iodine, but found it to be high in histamine. How do we get clean iodine? Well, Laura, you could use our ultra iodine as a supplemental um, if you'd like to use a supplemental form of iodine. The other way to get it is by eating seafood. Now, the the more say the more aged your seafood, the higher the level of histamine, the fresher your seafood, the lower level of histamine. So if you've got a histamine issue, you know, you might just consider supplementation. Pacemaker wires across the chest leading to electrodes in the heart. Three cardiologists have said the pacemaker is high tag, should be okay. So what about wires and electrodes in the heart? I can't answer that. You could you could get a meter and you could measure what the, you know, what the wires and leads are emanating. But I mean, you've got a pacemaker. And so it's one of those situations where what are you going to do? You can't take it out or turn it off. So um, that's a, that's a sticky situation. But the only way I would, I would say you, you would have knowledge about, you know, what it's actually emitting would be to, um, would be to put, uh, put a meter on it and measure it. How do you deal with Crohn's disease? I don't trust doctors, Diane's asking. So same way you deal with any autoimmunity, it's you figure out what are the triggers. There are four categorical triggers, biochemically speaking, for autoimmune disease. Food, um, chemical exposures, nutritional deficits, and microbial imbalances. Those four um, are what you want to have investigated and measured, Diane. Um, and by doing that, you'll, you'll discern which things are triggers for you. Um, it's my experience uh, in any time dealing with someone with Crohn's, a great place to start is a grain-free, dairy-free diet, uh, as many with Crohn's are reacting to those two food groups aggressively, as well as a sugar-free diet. Um, sugar can certainly exacerbate Crohn's. Uh, let's scroll down on the left just a little bit. How bad is EMF inside an electric car? Uh, there's just no way I'd buy an electric car. I'll answer it that way, Mark. I, I One, I know a lot of people are trying to go green. I think nobody thought this through. The whole green movement, first of all, all these electric cars that are supposed to save energy actually use more energy in the processing of batteries, cause more abuse in labor chains as a result of mining precious metals and ores for the batteries. I mean, so you're, you're already net negative energy for the life of the car, for the life of the battery. So the whole electric car being green and safe is, is nonsense. Uh, it's a dupe job. Um, is, but then you add the fact that they emit a tremendous amount of EMF inside the car. I've known, I've known people, uh, friends who bought Teslas, for example, and when they put their EMF readers inside the the car, it's off the charts. So, um, you know, the best way to know is to get your own reader and to measure what your car is doing. But um, I just don't recommend electric cars. 
for someone reactive or sensitive to gliadin, would the person also be equally reactive to the other grains with gluten? In my experience, yes, absolutely. Um, now, if you've only been tested for gliadin, you can't say for sure, but um, you know, you should, if you're trying to figure that out, get genetically tested. Had a temporary crown for two weeks, been struggling with digestive issues since, no mercury, no metals, just plastic tooth and chemical, how to detox. Permanent cement crown was placed three weeks ago. I hate that, Cheryl. You, anytime, this is just a lesson for any of you doing dental work. Always ask your dentist to do compatibility testing for any type of permanent fixture they're going to be putting into your mouth. And that includes crowns, that includes implants, um, bridges, whatever it might be. Um, you know, good biological dentist will run a compatibility test, meaning they'll measure you to see which types of dental materials you would potentially be reacting to. And so that helps them pick different materials to use. So um, if your dentist doesn't know what that is, um, you know, either do your best to educate them or find a biological dentist. But as far as detoxing, you know, just to, it depends on what's in your in your mouth. If you're allergic to plastics, Cheryl, if you're allergic to the the bisphenol or the phthalate plastics in that in that um, crown, you could be reacting to that. So I would go back and certainly talk to the dentist uh, about other potential options. What do you think about the calcium score scan? I think it's a good. It's a good test. It's a good scan. I don't think you put all your apples in that basket, but it is one good um, intelligent way to assess uh, arterial flow or blockage. Um, so certainly it can be used as a tool to help you understand those things better. Can something be done to support eating fruits with sorbitol? No tolerance to sorbitol and such delicious nutritious fruits. Mm, so big part of what I see when people are reacting to fruit and sorbitol in fruit, you know, this goes back to the people who do better on a low FODMAP diet, in some cases, even going carnivore. Um, but time, um, because a lot of people that have these issues with fruit, it's because they have an imbalanced microbiome where they have a lack of diversity in their microbiome so that when they're exposed to that sorbitol, they have no real great way to break it down with their microbiome. So, um, you probably have some other issues that need to be looked at or investigated. Are there any EMF protection devices that one can wear, i.e. necklaces or watches that actually are helpful and you would use yourself and your family? I haven't, I haven't come across anything that I believe is fully as protective as some of the companies out there selling the devices make claims about. Um, it's just an area where the science is too new and too many of these companies do their own proprietary research. And so it can't be replicated. And so you don't really know, does their product work or not? I think a lot of those products are kind of more than anything, peace of mind for people, but not necessarily effective. The best protection from EMF is abstinence. And so, you know, in this world, in this day and age, depending on where you live, if you live, you know, near a 5G tower right outside your window, or if you have, you know, you know, if you have um, a job where you go to work and you're being exposed there, I don't, I, it's hard to, to be 100% abstinent. But in this world, you want to be as abstinent as you can be. In other words, when you're in your downtimes, you don't want to have a phone in your pocket, put your phone in airplane mode. Um, turn your Wi-Fi or turn your wireless at home, your wireless router off at night when you sleep. You know, you can you can get a, a timer on your on your Wi-Fi devices to turn that thing off at bedtime for it to kick back on in the morning when you wake up if you need to use it. But minimize your exposure as much as you can. There are paints that can be used in your home that offer some EMF protection. Some people buy Faraday bags to put their phones in at night when they go to sleep. And that way, if you want to use your phone as an alarm clock by your bedside, if you put it in a Faraday bag, at least you're, you're blocking or shielding um, radiation from coming out and affecting you. But there's not a device outside of just a blockage, like, again, a Faraday bag that, uh, that I would say is scientifically been validated to really have any meaningful impact on protection. 
Uh, having an MTHFR and struggling, especially with sleep, I'm taking B vitamins and folate along with D3. What primary lab should I request from my primary? I mean, I would do a full nutrient panel, Vera. I would also look at your microbiome. Um, there's a lot to say about different types of microorganisms in the gut and, cir and circadian rhythm and sleep regulation. You might ask him to check your um, your melatonin levels as well, but you know, watch our sl our show on sleep because usually when people are struggling with sleep, it's not like one or five or six separate sets of labs that tell you this is exactly why you're struggling with sleep. A lot of times with sleep, it's behavior modification that needs to occur. And if you watch our sleep show. I go deep in, into behavior modification for sleep, and that might be very helpful for you. As far as will magnesium, three and eight help with sleep? It can. For many people, it, it does wonders um, for their sleep, um, including myself. If I want to go to sleep, if I'm struggling, I, I pop a couple hundred milligrams of magnesium, three and eight, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm out like a light. I've been sensitive to subwoofers, ear pain. Recently, um, phys, phys impact increased to heart palpitations, anxiety type symptoms, similar but other side of the spectrum. Take the same approach. Yes, avoidance is the best thing to do in that situation. A family member knows when near 5G tower pinpoint pain in temple region. Would a tinfoil hat literally help with that if they make EMF hats? They do. There are EMF clothing with shield um, type technologies in them that you you could wear when you're around some of these devices. I've seen hats um, and uh, and wearables. Uh, gloves and other things. Actually, I just had I just had somebody come in last week to the practice who was having a lot of hand pain. Um, our suspicion was that she was spending several hours a day on her cell phone, and it was actually it was a radiation from the phone causing the arthritis and the swelling in the hand. Um, so that you know that that goes back to you know. Some people are now making hats and gloves that are protective from EMF. How effective these are, I don't have any personal experience with them and their use. And there's not enough collective data. But um, in, in that regard, if you're, if you're near a 5G tower, it might be worthwhile investigating and hacking yourself. Any hacks for the home if you live near 5G? Yeah, set up the mesh. They make a, a wire mesh you can put in your wall. Um, they make paints that you can paint your wall with. Um, those are all potential options, you know, to reduce your exposure. The other, the other thing would be test, get a meter and test your home for hot spots. Um, you know, if you sit down in your living room every morning and you sit in a chair and there's a huge hot spot of, EMF in that where you sit, consider rearranging your furniture. Like I've, I've seen cases where people had different hotspots in different locations of their home. I've even seen cases where people, when they measured the EMF emitting near where they lay their head in their bed, it was off the chart because the, um, the outlet behind the wall or, or there was a, a there was a um, electrical device in the wall that was emanating EMF. And so they were just lying in a field of it all night. So having a home tester to kind of get get an idea of where your hot spots are so that you can try to avoid you know putting your bed near them or putting your chairs where you would sit and spend time in your home um but the other thing is turn you know hardwire your equipment um you know a lot of people want the convenience of you know cordless technology with or wire you know wireless technology and so everything is, is, is Wi-Fi. Turn that stuff off and hardwire into a LAN cable, um, and you'll reduce a lot of your exposure just, just in that way. The other thing is, is, is quit using the earbuds. I see this all the time. I even see this in, the, in like some of the expert 
bloggers on, online that the so-called experts and they're they're doing interviews and they're wearing ear pods or whatever that brand is you know from the from the fruit company um those things are radiation right to your ear right to your brain it's, those are, in my opinion they're dangerous there's no way you'd catch me ever wearing these these wi-fi um ear earbud devices uh, it's always best to have a hard wire i still have, I have an old phone for that reason with a hardwired set of headphones and i probably will never upgrade for that very reason unless they create phones that have the ability to have those hardwired antennas um just to me it's just not worth it hyperparathyroid which leads to high calcium do we know the cause at all a lot of times it's a vitamin d deficiency i've seen that several times ben so you might have your doctor measure your 25 ohd if it's below 30 um, consider you know supplementing anywhere from eight to ten thousand units of vitamin d a day until you get it above 70 and see how that impacts your calcium level because what happens with hyperparathyroid is when your vitamin d is low Vitamin D is responsible for upregulating absorption of calcium from the food through your intestines. And so if you don't have adequate vitamin D and you're not absorbing it very effectively, your bone, your, your parathyroids will produce uh, parathyroid hormone that will tell your bone to release calcium. Because if your calcium blood serum calcium goes down too low, it can actually trigger major problems. So your body has, you know, a reservoir of calcium in the bone. So you'll start pulling calcium from the bone into the blood when there's a vitamin D deficiency. And sometimes that leads to high calcium. So I've seen a number of cases where it, you know, maybe even a misdiagnosis, not technically hyperprimary hyperparathyroidism, it's vitamin D induced uh, hyperparathyroid issues. So check that. What are your thoughts on the SPF shirts? If one needs to stay outside for an extended period of time, any shirts SPF, Tammy, I mean, a shirt, a shirt that, that offers any level of, of barrier between, you know, the UV light of the sun and your skin is an SPF shirt. So don't spend a bunch of money on these chemically loaded SPF shirts. Just wear a, a long sleeve shirt and that's going to give you protection as well. It doesn't have to be special SPF. Uh, let's see here. Both of my sons, 16 and 20, have moderate severe psoriasis diagnosed in the last year. We have done IG, IgG testing and three-day stool test, gut work, and some detox. Um, some improvements, but not fully. Any suggestions? I mean, I, without knowing what the results of some of that stuff was and whether or not you had reevaluations, I mean, IgE and IgG, if you're talking about testing of those two, four food sensitivities, you're missing IgA, IgM, you're missing immune complex, you're missing T cell response. So there could be some other food reactions that you haven't ac accurately picked up on. And so that might be uh, an area you want to look at. So, um, you know, if your doctor doesn't doesn't do that type of testing, you can do it through Gluten Free Society. It's it's our delayed hypersensitivity food test, where we detect 222 different different foods. Um, so you might consider that. You might also consider micronutrient testing because with psoriasis, sometimes there's micronutrient deficits. There's you know commonly ones I see omega three zinc can play a role in that situation. Vitamin D can play a role. So I, I would be looking at those things if they haven't been already assessed. Um, and then also if you, you know, if you haven't had uh, gluten um, looked at, uh, I see it all the time. Gluten is a primary driver of psoriasis in a hundred percent of the cases that I've ever seen in my practice. So if your kids are not gluten grain free, you might consider testing them and, and taking appropriate action. I've taken Histocyst for some time now and it always helps me. In fact, it's the only thing that helped me at all after having two different sinus surgeries and multiples of medications. Wow, that's, a, that's an awesome review. Thank you for that, Dee. Um, if, you, if you would consider leaving that review at Gluten Free Society, uh, we would appreciate it. In regards to EMF exposure, can covering my modem with aluminum foil reduce exposure? 
potentially the best way to know Stacy would be to get a, a get an EMF reader um, and do that and then measure it before and after to see does it reduce you know the the exposure does it reduce the the level of um, of radiation coming off the device I read not to take Zeek supplement at the same time as magnesium there's no reason to not take them simultaneously, Mary. That's a ridiculous notion. I don't know where you read that, um, but whoever said that doesn't understand very well that there are so many foods that contain both zinc and magnesium simultaneously. And I, don't, I don't think if God put them together in that way that that, that you know that it would be problematic within a supplement. But um, again, uh, I don't think there's a problem with that. Pam says, I read your book, changing my whole diet out. Should I do your gene test or any other test before my appointment with you five months from now? You can, Pam, but um, I, I would, if you're coming to see me, I would just strongly encourage that you wait. Because if you do things prematurely before we get to talk through and, and look at everything, um, if you read my book, there's a section in the, the last chapter on piecemealing, right? And what happens with a lot of folks when they go see functional practitioners is, um, they, they do one thing at a time. And, and, and so for example, um, you might get a, 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 a nutrition deficiency test and, and apply that for a few months. And then you don't really see a tremendous improvement or change. And then you go and do a, uh, food sensitivity test and you apply that for a few months and then you might not see a whole ton of changes. And then, um, and then you move on and you do some kind of hormone testing and you apply that for a few months and you don't see that like each one of these things is an incomprehensive piecemeal approach. And so when you don't address health holistically, why, where you're addressing all the systems simultaneously, usually the outcomes are not great. It's why, again, my opinion, that's why a lot of doctors fail to, to get great results with their clientele. So um, it's better to have all the data that's new that's current at the same time so that you can apply it all simultaneously. Uh, do you offer online consults? I do. If you want a nutritional consultation, you can reach out to Origins um, and that Phone number is 281-240-2229. If we could put that, maybe drop that in the chat, Mel, uh, for, um, for YouTube. How much protein should a vegan active 70-year-old woman get? At least, um, if you're active, one and a half grams per kilogram of body weight is a, if, you're, if your body weight is healthy. Um would be a good place to start you might check out to our show on protein i do a deep dive on protein and and uh and go a lot deeper in in that topic if you want to learn more I, um, I eat super healthy and limited sugar and carb, uh, limited sugar and limited carb diet, but I do enjoy two cups of coffee a day. Am I doing myself a disservice? Maybe, you know, um, it's my experience working with thousands of folks that I, I generally tend to like to limit people to one cup a day. Um, one cup of coffee at a normal size, you know, six ounce cup, not a, not a 24 ounce slugger but a six ounce cup, uh, that's about 120 milligrams of caffeine. Generally, what, what I see when people go over that, when they get into that 200 plus milligram a day of caffeine, they overstimulate their adrenal glands, they overwork their adrenal glands, they cause nutrient deficiencies through um, hyperurination through the urine. And so you might be, if you're generally healthy, um, 
and doing that, it, it, you know, you may be just fine, but it may catch up to you. It's hard to say for sure, but I would, I would just ask yourself what, why two and not one, you know, if, if, you know, if it's an easy change and, and it doesn't just, you know, it doesn't, you know, doesn't break down the quality of your life tremendously. Um, my opinion going down a little bit would be a smart move. Can a person become more allergic and sensitive after a general detox? I, I don't know what a general detox is, Cynthia. Uh, maybe elaborate, but not typically. I mean, if you're doing a, a detox, it doesn't, the detox itself doesn't make you more allergic or more sensitive. Now, some people have a detox response when they're going through a detox where they're picking up symptoms because they're, um, they're over, overburdened or overloaded with toxic substrates in their bodies. Now, as it's trying to detox these things out, it can become, you know, symptomatic more so, but uh, it's the best answer I can give you. Uh, I got your deficiency test uh, and went to the lab about a month ago. How long does it take to get the results? Usually about a month, Shannon. You might reach out to Malaya, Glutenology at Gmail, and just um, inquire with her. And she can give you a more exacting answer um, as far as where, where they're at in the process of getting you your, your result. Are flaxseed crackers okay on a gluten-free diet? You know, if they're just made out of flaxseed, they are. Um, but I, I would encourage any of you, a lot, a lot of people trying to go gluten-free, just they, they falter into the trap of processed food way too much. And so crackers falls in that category. I, I would just be cautious about any processed food. When you're trying to restore your health, it's really hard to do if you have a staple diet that's you know, that's rich in processed foods, even if they are gluten-free. There's, you know, there's a major study published here recently on ultra processing of foods and the deterioration of human health as a result of doing that. And I think it's something we should all be thinking about. The fresher you can eat, the more close to the whole food, to the real food you can eat, the better off I think you're going to be. Been gluten free for five years, but chronic constipation will not go away. Could going grain free do the trick? Yeah, for many it does. Uh, and and could cutting out dairy do the trick? Yep, for many it does. Look, in my practice, I have um, when people test positive for gluten, we have them go grain free and dairy free. You know, period. And if you haven't gone in that direction yet, it's certainly worthwhile doing to see if it if it helps you. Is cheese made from sheep's milk a healthier alternative to cheese made from dairy cows? Well, possibly, maybe. The different the sheep milk is A2. Sheep, sheep and goat have A2 casein, and that part's better, you know, than say just a regular A1 dairy cheese uh, or A1 cow dairy cheese. Um, but it also depends on what they're feeding the sheep. You know, I mean, I think animal husbandry and animal care is a big important part of the health of the byproduct of the animal. So, you know, it's always a good idea to know the quality of the care of the animals for any kind of product you're buying and when you're trying to evaluate whether or not it's good for you. Um, but I wouldn't put sheep cheese in a category of healthier anything unless I knew about more about how the, sheep's, uh, the sheep were being raised and taken care of. Does, does taking collagen help people with Ehlers-Danlos um, hypermobile syndrome looking for a functional approach? I haven't seen taking collagen to be tremendously beneficial for, you know, tightening up the hypermobility. Um, but what I have seen do um, very, very well for individuals with with EES is vitamin B12, grain-free diets, and really focusing or honing in on building muscle strength. Um, because when you have hyperlaxicity in your tendons and ligaments, you, you, you can build strength in your muscles and you can reduce some of that hypermobility and you can add better support to your joints if you have strong uh, lean muscle mass. 
Is it important to keep the desiccant packet in the supplement bottles once opened? Can be that desiccant packet absorbs moisture. So once you open the bottle and break the seal, you know, if you live in, in a high humid, you know, area, like let's say you're in Florida on the Gulf uh, and your humidity is relatively much higher then that desiccant is going to help absorb some of that moisture and it's going to reduce the aging, if you will, or the detriment of aging of the supplement product. Because once you open the bottle, it will start to oxidize and remember that water will accelerate that process. So the desiccant packet can be helpful in that regard. Same thing with the cotton inserts. Those things are moisture absorbance. Yeah, so if you drink RO water, you can add sea salt to it. You can also add electrolyte, an electrolyte blend to it to get put the electrolytes back in it. Either one of those things are acceptable. Low-hanging fruit to limit EMF exposure. The lowest hanging fruit is turn off the device. You know, you don't... When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have cell phones. Most of you watching this, probably if you're anywhere near my age, you know, cell phones didn't become popular until about 15, maybe 20 years ago. And now everybody's got to have them. And then they're an extension of everyone's anatomy. And it's just, to me, I find it quite ridiculous. I understand the convenience and the, and the power of um, ability of connection that they provide. But I mean, you know, find connection from human to human, you know, that you don't have to have that phone on you every single day. I think people have become dependent on these things um, a little bit too aggressively. So consider turning them off, consider putting them in airplane mode, consider not carrying one everywhere you go um, and hardwire your house. I mean, really, those are the, the, the lowest hanging fruit you can really tackle EMF with. Does your company do genetic testing? Yes, we do. We do we do HLA-DQ genetic testing for gluten sensitive gene patterns. And so um, if you're looking to see whether or not uh, going gluten free is the right move for you, we offer the most comprehensive DNA testing on that uh, available anywhere. What can I do to absorb my vitamin D better? Um, take it in an emulsified form. We have two kinds of vitamin D in emulsified forms. We have liquid D3 and we have um, gluten-free D. Those two products are both gluten-free, but they're also, they're um, mycelized. So they will absorb. If you take them, you will absorb them. They are, they are um, because they're wrapped in, in a micelle that it's going to make them as, as absorbable as water. So even if you have celiac disease or malabsorption disorder, you'll still absorb that vitamin D product really well. How high is EMF in hospital zone areas? It depends on the hospital and what they've got going on with their technology. I mean, again, the best way to know any with any of it is to is to measure it. And um, you know, I know some people that carry around meters with them, and you know, they'll position themselves accordingly uh, based on their meter feedback. I heard that grass-fed cows are given a COVID jab at all USDA-approved facilities, slaughterhouses. No, that's not true. Um, I don't know where you heard that, but that's not true. So it's a question about um, lymphoma. Can you talk about aspects of lymphoma? I think if you've got lymphoma and you are not eating 100% organic, you need to be. Um, you know, with the recent lawsuits on glyphosate causing lymphoma and jury trials, you know, ruling in favor of, of plaintiffs, I think you've got to look at that data. You know, the, the, all, the, all the big agribusinesses will tell you, oh, don't worry about glyphosate, but we're now seeing jury trials say opposite and we already have science and we know that lymphoma increased risk of lymphoma with glyphosate we also know that lymphoma is an increased risk in people with gluten sensitivity so if you're not on a gluten grain-free diet you definitely want to consider that as well you might want to check out we did a crash course on cancers and uh, we have a nice article on the different cancer associations with gluten sensitivity as well lymphoma being one of them and so that might be some uh, a good resource for you to check out
How do I absorb nutrients if my gallbladder was removed? My skin is severely dehydrated. Even if I drink lots of water, I pee very frequently. I get up multiple times at night and I always get bloated. Um, if you've got your gallbladder out, you can still absorb. It's not an issue of, of, you know, your gallbladder helps you to digest and absorb fat through the action of bile salts. Um, when you have your gallbladder removed, you still make bile. Your liver is the organ that produces bile and your liver will dump bile into your small intestine. It just won't do it as efficiently or effectively without a gallbladder. So it's not, it's not like you have no bile crystal. Um, if you want to use a supplement that supports the timing of bile, you can use, we have something called Lipogest that helps with that absorption. As far as your hydration and dehydration, a big part of that's going to depend on the quality of the water, whether or not you have electrolyte in your water. And there are a lot of reasons why people might have increased urination or increased frequency of urination. I mean, diabetes or high blood sugar could be a component of that. I see that a lot in people that have mold exposure and mycotoxin exposure or other environmental pollutant exposures at mass quantities that will hyper cause hyper urination. So you might, you might look at all of those as potential factors. Um, how do you detox from a PET scan radiation? I mean, more than anything, protect yourself going in. Um, you know, there, you know, the body has natural defense mechanisms to protect itself from radiative damages. Um, iodine is one of those nutrients. Glutathione is certainly one of those nutrients. And acetylcysteine can be very potent and effective at helping your body in that regard. So I would go in with those things in mind, like, consider dosing those supplements as support before you go in to get a scan. Yes, the question is pork. Um, a lot of pork is fed corn or other grains. Um, so we have some pork recipes in no grain, no pain, and you can substitute those with beef if you'd like. But um, part of the reason we have pork recipes is you can actually get grass fed pork. Um, one of the best breeds to buy pork, it's that uh, these, these types of pigs thrive really well on grass is, is a breed called a Cooney Cooney pig. And those, um, those are actually what we farm. We actually have them on our farm. Um, so pork can, can be a part of the diet without all the grain feed. You just have to make sure you're buying from the right type of farmer. Do ground up eggshells work for calcium? I mean, there's certainly calcium in ground up eggshells. Um, best thing to know that to answer that question, Sandy, would be to, if you, something you're doing is measure your calcium. Um, get your calcium measured periodically. Is, is it working for you? It's not whether or not there's calcium. It's not, it's not a question of whether there's cal not, whether or not there's calcium in eggshells. It's just, you know, is it, is it the best and the most bioavailable form to take? Probably not. Um, there, there are much better forms of calcium supplementally a person could take, um, especially the amino acid um, chelate, chelate versions of, of calcium, like calcium citrate, calcium malate, etc. Okay. Um, looks like I'm at an end today, folks. If you didn't get your question answered, we'll be back next Thursday. Um, thanks for being patient with me uh, for this late start today, but um, hope you have a fantastic weekend and we will see you next Tuesday for a live show and Thursday for another live Q&A. Take care.